Okay. So uh, uh, let me first give you a brief summary of what we are doing right now. Okay. Um, we are designing a, a control loop, feedback loop, looking at the, uh, uh, the properties of frequency propagation from uh, reference side to the uh, response side, okay, from input to the output. So the, 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 the logic here, the hypothesis here is that if the system allows uh, sufficiently wide uh, bandwidth of waveforms, right, sinusoidal waveforms from left to the right, uh, we expect that pretty much the same signal right that you input from the reference side will appear on the response side output side so that is the rational behind this okay and on the other hand if you figure out by analyzing the system in in terms of frequency that not enough uh, waveforms frequencies uh, propagate from left to right uh, without much of attenuation phase delay and so on then you are not going to expect, right? You're not going to get the response that you need. That is pretty clear, right? So, and it is very, very fundamental to uh, control systems, right? So that is why now probably you, be, you begin to realize that this is the fundamental way of designing a system, right? Even though before this time, we worked on the time domain, uh, we look at the loops, uh, the, the poles, and uh, second order systems, rise time, and so on, right? But now you figure out that all these things are actually secondary, right? Uh, dependent properties, right? The core fundamental property of a feedback loop is actually frequency domain, right? So having said that, so let's uh, get into the nitty gritties. So the problem at hand was this, right? To design, uh, the feedback loop, figure out what are the additional components you need to introduce to the system in order to maintain uh, sufficient bandwidth of the system and then sufficient gain margin, phase margin and uh, steady state error, those, those things. We have taken the problem to a significant extent last uh, lecture, right? Now we have uh, as you can see over here, right? Uh, uh, again, 129.3 to improve the bandwidth. So when you improve the bandwidth, you let uh, an adequate amount of frequencies to travel from one side to the other side which means you are going to get a good response. And then we decide, uh, designed a lead compensator. This is basically to make sure you have sufficient phase margin, okay? Which means all these frequencies that are going from one side to the other, they are not seriously phase shifted. It is much better if you can bring them in phase without even any phase uh, delay, but that is not possible. So what is possible is that to make sure whatever phase delay uh, that is occurring uh, through the propagation uh, is not causing you a serious problem. So to ensure that, what we do is we maintain uh, uh, adequate gain margin, uh, sorry, phase margin. So that uh, is achieved using the lead compensator here. You can see S plus 10.8 over S plus 37. We designed all these things last time. And also in order to make sure that this design, the lead compensator will not uh, affect already designed bandwidth, right? You, you have to add another 1.85 gain. So now you will realize that uh, the gain adjustment uh, happens a uh, number of times, right? Within the design, right? So, uh, after phase margin adjustment, this is what we got, okay? So now, if you look at the zero dB line here, 
on the gain or magnitude plot of board A, right? It crosses the line here, which is 20 radians per second. That is the bandwidth. And at that point, if you come down onto the uh, phase plot, you will see the phase is now 135 negative, which means from here, you have another 45 degrees to minus 180 degrees, which is the unstable situation. So the 45 degree margin is healthy, sufficient. Now, the last part of the design is the steady state error. Because in the design, uh, it was dictated to have whatever uh, uh, steady state error, right? So now we have to achieve that. To achieve the steady state error, uh, or improve the steady state error, we can use a lag composite, right? Lag composite, and you have to do it very carefully. Uh, this is in a way like a, a surgeon operating a patient, right? If the problem is in the kidneys, you need to operate uh, that portion in the kidney, right? Uh, you don't have to uh, look at the lungs and the heart and the other organs, right? So face lead, face lag, and all the other things, right? They are also clinical treatments that to uh, do uh, to the control loop, right? For example, when you do a lead compensator, and now you are going to do a lag compensator, if the lag compensator is going to affect the lead compensator, then there's no end for this process, right? Now, you have already adjusted your bandwidth, you have already adjusted your phase margin, and now you are trying to do something else that should not sabotage or jeopardize all the things that you have done up to now. Okay. So therefore, that is why it has to be clinically designed. So when you say clinically designed uh, in frequency domain, you are referring to different areas in the spectrum. Okay. So which means if you have your uh, lead compensator in one part of the spectrum, you better not design your lag compensator in the same part of the spectrum, okay? So you better go to some other part and do your design so that whatever you do there will not affect uh, what you have already done using the lead compensator, okay? So you don't put both compensators on the same bandwidth, right? So that is a fundamental thing you need to remember. Okay, <laughs> so... Uh, now, if you just write a simple equation for error, right? error is the signal over here, it is basically R minus Y, right? isn't it? So then if you look at what is Y, Y is the result of this forward loop, which is coming from error, lead compensator, gain, and the plant. So this is the entire cascaded system of blocks, right? So now you can figure out uh, your ES, right? ES is here, ES is here. Eventually like this, one over one plus lead compensator K times GS times RS, okay? Now, uh, if you look at the, uh, the final value theorem, right? Sometime back we studied this one. What is the final value of the response? So what is the final value of the error? What is the final value of any signal, right? It can be uh, determined using this one. Limit as S goes to zero, right? S times whatever that signal, one over S. This is the uh, uh, steady state error, right? For a unit step signal, all right? So now this S and S cancel out. It is eventually this block here, right? That comes over here. And uh, because you know your lead compensator, you know your gain, the forward gain, and GS is also known, right? You can substitute it over here and calculate your steady state error. So as S goes to zero. So this block is actually a function of S, comes over here. There are other things numbers you know every everything the lead compensator the gain everything so it will eventually be 0 0.087 like uh, point 
one, nearly point one. Uh, to be exact, zero point zero eight seven. Okay, so that is the steady state error, uh, which is there at the moment. But I think your requirement is. What is the requirement? The requirement is to bring the steady state error to zero point zero one. 0.01. How much you have now? 0.08. Okay, so now this is the problem. The steady state error is too big. You have to reduce. So for that, what we do is uh, we design a lag compensator. Now again, uh, the lag compensator is something like this. S plus Z over S plus P, right? One zero and one pole. So when you bring the lag compensator, right, into the block here, you are going to put it over here, right, before the lead compensator. And therefore, this new lag compensator is going to come over here into the transfer function. Clear? In this transfer function, it will appear here. So like this, you have the lead composite and then the lag composite here. Okay. Now with this lag compensator, if you look at the steady state error again, as we did earlier, as limit S goes to zero, S times the block one over S. Remember this one, S times the error one over S, right? So it is this entire block here. Uh, most of the parameters are known. S is zero. What is unknown is this zero and pole, zero and pole. So when you simplify this one, it becomes like this. And that is the steady state error. Now you can understand that you can set your steady state error here and then calculate your pole and zero, your pole and zero. So it is, this is not unique. There are uh, infinite number of solutions here in order to bring steady state error to whatever number you want, 0 0.01, right? Uh, you can have so many different combinations of the pole and the zero. That is why I said, don't go into the lead compensator direction, go the other direction and set your uh, lag compensator. So then this lag compensator or the lead compensator, they will disturb the frequency uh, uh, profile, but at, at different levels, at different regions in the frequency spectrum. So therefore, you will not be actually uh, going into an infight between the lag and the lead. So now you substitute ESS uh, 0 0.01, right? And then get uh, this one, is it over P to be 9.66. Now, uh, there is a rule of thumb for lag composite design that is place the pole and zero near the origin so that the effect is confined to low frequencies. Ah, that's the point. Now you have your frequency spectrum, your bandwidth is 20 radius per second, and you already designed your lead compensator around that frequency, 20 radians per second. Now, uh, if you go the other direction that is near origin, low frequency, to design your lead compensator, that will solve the problem, okay? So the two compensators are in either side of the spectrum, okay? So, 
we can from here on it is uh, intuitive right you can figure out one of the variables and calculate the other one because uh, it's simply this equation you know the ratio between the zero and pole so there are infinite number of combinations so let's select a pole to be 0 0.1 then uh, uh, pole 0 0.1 then the 0 0.1 Nine five. So this will be uh, the lag compensator. Okay, right. So uh, now uh, look at the the comment here. At bandwidth frequency twenty radians per second. Lag compensator gain is nearly unity. Now, if you look at this lag compensator, uh, you have selected zero and pole uh, to be very close uh, to the origin. So, therefore, uh, you are affecting only the low frequencies. You are not affecting the high frequencies, high in the sense relative 20 radius per second bandwidth. So, therefore, you can be happy about the existing phase margin and all right bandwidth is not affected phase margin is, is not affected uh, but on the other hand you might still be uh, cautious about the gain of this block because if you add a gain to the block right uh, you are going to change your bandwidth again so to check that out as you know every block right uh, if you look at this particular block if you want to calculate the gain of the block right gain of this block at any frequency you put that value here s equals whatever that frequency okay then you can calculate the gain that this block is introducing uh, at that frequency now our interesting frequency here is 20 radians per second we don't want to change the gain at 20 radius per second if you do that you are changing your bandwidth but that will affect the phase margin also right so therefore if you just put here s equals j omega so this will be j20 and j20 here because if you compare these two numbers with 20 they are small numbers okay therefore you will you can say simply that the gain of this particular block at 20 radius per second which is far away from the origin is nearly unity okay so this is not going to affect the bandwidth uh, of the plant already set bandwidth of the plant is that clear to everyone please uh, unmute your mics and let me know this lag compensator design and that it is not going to affect the bandwidth and all these things. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Gane Is there any things that is not clear? No, sir. It is clear. Right. Then Arya Tilaka? Yes. Kalana? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, Halali? Yes, sir. Uh, sir. One question is possible. Yes, go ahead. Is it possible to do the vice versa, design the compensate and then go back and design the gain for the unity bandwidth? Yeah, yeah. That's possible, but the thing is, uh, 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 it will be little lengthier than this one. Oh. Oh. Yeah, some some of these gains you can calculate together rather than defining it different moments. But because this is a teaching exercise more than a practicing exercise, uh, I line up the content in that order. Mm without mixing things up so that you will 
misunderstand and confuse so uh, these steps you don't have to follow strictly this way when you uh, develop your experience working with the compensators you can have uh, you can cut short the process right uh, of course you can design the uh, uh, the lag compensator before the lead right because in the frequency domain these things are not uh, uh, talking to each other they're different independent in the moment you will see that yes uh, bulat singh hello is everything clear to you sorry bulat singh hello gay sendanayaka Yes, sir. Right. Excuse me, sir. Yes. So in the previous slide, uh, the zero point zero one value is the uh, required there. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes, that's right. Go ahead. So zero point zero one is the required there. Yes, sir. I need to clarify that. So that is what is given. If you go back, uh, where is that? We are solving a problem. This is the problem. Design a, com a compensator to have bandwidth twenty radians per second, phase margin forty five, and unit step steady state error of zero point zero one. We want to design the plant. to achieve this that is where the error comes from okay okay sir any other questions please okay fine let's move so now uh, i think you are you are good in drawing the body plots now right uh, if i give any any simple block like this you can simply go to matlab and define your numerator define your denominator and build your transfer function using tf command and then draw the body plot a simple four four lines right you will get this one for the lag compensator So see what is there. This is magnitude, right? Twenty dB. Twenty dB. That that's a big value, right? Uh, for low frequencies, and then there's a roll off, and after that it is zero dB. Zero dB means unity gain. Unity gain. So if you look at the frequency spectrum here, this is ten uh, to the minus three radians per second, and this is the one radians per second. This is one. This is ten. This is twenty. Uh, sorry, a uh, hundred. So twenty is. This is ten. This is twenty. So if you follow this line, twenty radians per second. This is the bandwidth frequency. So there you can see the gain of the block at bandwidth frequency is nearly one. Which means uh, this is not going to change the bandwidth. of the plant this is not going to uh, alter whatever you did uh, earlier around 20 radians per second so if you come down a little bit here you can see this is the phase at 20 radians per second it is also very near to zero so therefore whatever phase change this particular block is introducing to the plant at 20 radians per second is also very small so all in all you can reasonably conclude that this like compensator does not have any effect any significant effect either in terms of magnitude or phase right around 20 radians per second but if you come 
to the lower side somewhere here. So this is uh, 0.1 radians per second. This is 0 0.2, 0 0.3. If you look at 0.3 radians per second, that is very, very low frequency, right? There's a big uh, phase lag. There's a big phase lag near, nearly about 60 degrees. Phase lag. Phase lag is not good. Phase lag is not good. But this phase lag is at very low frequencies. Not the bandwidth frequency, not the bandwidth frequency. So now if I go back and show you what we got for the lead compensator, right? It's this. This is the lead compensator. And the peak is around 20 radians per second. Now we are talking about 0 0.3 radians per second. That is that is over here. So you, you design your lag compensator at this point, around this point, and your lead compensator around this point. They are sufficiently far away from each other. And if you, if you draw them together on the same spectrum, you will see that uh, uh, they're not going to talk to each other, right? So now this is the final system. You have the lag compensator, the lead, the gain uh, bandwidth adjuster, and then the plant. Right. So th this is a this is a in a way a, a massive example. Right. Uh, it tells you how to adjust your phase margin, how to adjust your steady state error, how to improve your bandwidth. So if, almost everything is there. Now, uh, maybe you want to simulate this. But before that, let's put uh, the final body plot also here, right? So the final one is G3. G3. The original one is G, right? So from G, we uh, designed G1, then G2, then uh, G3. So G1 is basically bandwidth adjustment. G2 is phase margin adjustment. G3 is steady state error adjustment. Right. Now, if you come uh, over to 20 radians per second, that is over here, right? You can see G3, right, is uh, actually following the same phase there. So therefore, phase margin is not going to change. And if you come up, you can see 20 radians per second. It's almost there. It's almost there, right? I, it's, it's not going to change. And if you look at the lower side, there is a there is a change here. There is a high gain in the lower frequencies. So that is okay. This is because to increase the steady state uh, error. Okay. And as a result of that, there's a phase loss in the low frequency, but that is not going to affect the performance because this is at low frequency, right? Anything in the bandwidth frequency could have uh, deteriorated uh, the performance, right? But uh, this lag compensator operates around a very low frequency, 0.3 radians per second. So it doesn't have any effect on the bandwidth frequency. So this whole exercise is uh, alternatively known as loop shaping. Maybe you have heard that word, loop shaping. We are shaping the loop, the feedback loop, right? So that is why it is called that way. Now, you can simulate this uh, block diagram, uh, this uh, uh, feedback loop uh, in Simulating. This is another thing you need to know as control system uh, engineers, how to build a, a complicated system in MATLAB, right? Uh, again, learn yourself. This is uh, something that anybody can learn, right? Open your uh, MATLAB, open the Simulink, right? 
and uh, there's a there are libraries from where you can pick up the blocks, pick up the signal sources, signal things, data files, everything, right? And build your block one by one. Let's say this is your plant. This is how you define your plant. There's a transfer function, one, three, over one, seven, 32, eight, right? So that is the transfer function. This one, this one. When you multiply these two together, right, you can get the denominator. This is the numerator. And then you have the bandwidth adjustment at 20 radians per second, right? You want to have uh, this 20 radians per second. So therefore you have 129.3 gain. This is the lead compensator. This is the additional gain because the lead compensator changes the bandwidth a little bit because it is already happening, always happening in the bandwidth frequency. So therefore, you definitely need to recorrect your bandwidth. And this is the lag compensator. So after that, this is the reference. I'm going to send uh, uh, different uh, frequency components to the plant, right? I have uh, sine 1t, uh, sin 3t and sin 5t with different phase angles also. I combine them together to generate uh, synthesize uh, signal, right? And uh, then the input signal goes to this uh, scope, right? Rin, the input, right? And then the output goes to Y out, uh, tracking response. So I'm going to draw on screen input and the output together to check how close the system is able to follow a varying input here. I have designed the entire system using the steady state error and everything using step signal, okay? But now this is uh, for my own uh, understanding about the plan. If I send sinusoidal waveforms as input, three of them, right, with different phase uh, delays, I'm going to check how accurately the system can follow the input. So in uh, Simulink, you can run this one using this uh, button here and the data will be uh, saved to the workspace and after that you can plot it like this. Right, so this uh, da dash line is RT like this and YT is the actual response. You can see it is closely following this is the kind of waveform that we would like to see in uh, mechatronic robotics servo systems where input is uh, a, a varying signal all the time. It changes all the time, right? And uh, you need to have your control system uh, to follow the varying uh, input as closely as possible, right? So when you do the loop shaping, you have to do it in the frequency domain because of that, that reason, because most of the time your input signals are not like uh, uh, standard triangle signals, step signals, impulse and so on. It will be a varying, time varying, uh, continuous signal from the input, uh, the reference. So uh, I can increase uh, my input signals because when you do this in simulating, you can have the sine 1t, sine 3t, sine 5t. So this is uh, omega equals one, one radius per second, three radius per second, five radius per second, like that. You can change these numbers. And uh, when you increase your frequency, you will uh, start to see the deviation from the input, right? And the reference is unable to follow, right, the input. So because the system is designed for a particular bandwidth and uh, a system is not able to follow uh, every frequency, right? Because it is designed for a limited bandwidth. Yes. So uh, that's about it. Uh, I want you to do this in Simulink, right? Uh, this entire example that I have done here, right? I want you to do it yourself.
not only this one as i said to you even before right um i worked out with you a lot of examples right and um, you are supposed to do everything that i have done here right at your leisure time using matlab uh, you need to generate your own matlab repository all the codes results keep it there right uh and this is a kind of climax where you put everything together and eventually simulate the the whole system uh, in matlab using simulate please do that also any questions okay fine yes go ahead in the initial stage of today's session that is uh, i have to find the value theorem to find the error yes that uh, can you uh, please clarify a little bit how it the equation obtained uh for that i think uh, i recommend you read final value theorem in the book right in the textbook there's a section for final value theorem the derivation and everything is there and there are a lot of documents on the internet also you can easily learn yourself right final value theorem is basically coming from uh, the first uh, course in controls from undergrad so and any laplace transform courses you may have done earlier has the final value theorem there uh, so please do that yourself right and look at the reference book uh, the chapters are available on the website if, if you don't have the book yourself uh, the chapters are there on the website right uh, look at the uh, laplace transform chapter uh, there you can find out the final value theorem these things you uh, i expect you to do uh, self learning right uh, i think you you guys are okay you can do a lot of things right you usually do you learn yourself on the present context uh, even kids can learn themselves a lot of things on the internet using phones and devices right so uh, these uh, little things i'm not going i don't discount anything as little right everything is important but there's a sequence that we line up the content so some of the fundamental things i'm not going to teach here right so uh, rather i would like to direct you to self learn some of the things like matlab for example i'm not not going to teach here matlab so i think anybody can learn self final value theorem and most of the laplace transforms we don't do it here right uh, but uh, you are supposed to brush up yourself laplace transforms matlab these are prerequisites okay uh if you just google it final value theorem you, you can see it is not a very lengthy derivative it's a short uh, uh process you can simply understand it yes. any other questions all right so uh then uh, we go to the uh, next lecture Okay
Can you see the screen now? PID controller. Yes, sir. All right. So uh, PID controller is the most common, most widely known uh, industrial controller. So therefore we need to look at it very closely. And there are very good reasons for this controller to be the most uh, popular kind of controller in the industry, right? Uh, because of number of reasons. Upfront, I can say, without any uh, uh, big knowledge about control systems, a practitioner, a technician, or an engineer can tune PID controllers and get the uh, get better performance, right? Uh, Second thing, uh, PID control can be tuned for almost any any plan, right? So, uh, with of course varying degrees of accuracy, appropriateness, and so on. But generally, it can handle a lot of uh, plants. So let's uh, look at in details. PID controller will look like this when you put it into a plant. So this is the plant, this is the PID controller. It comes in front of the plant, very much like the face lead compensator, the lag compensator, the gain, etc. that we discussed earlier, right? This is a block that comes in front of the plant. Inside this block, PID controller, there are three parameters, KP, KD, KI. Or you can identify them differently as KP, TD, and TI. This way or this way. Okay. This three parameter controller, right? Three parameter controller. The three parameters are KP. It's a gain coming from the proportional part. We call it proportional gain. Then we have KD, that is the derivative gain. Then we have KI and call it integral gain. Proportional, derivative and integral. That is why we call it PID, okay? Now, this is the most simplest way of writing the PID controller in Laplace domain, right? In Laplace domain, the error is ES. You can call it big E like this, right? ES, you multiply it with a gain and we call it proportional gain, proportional to the error, okay? Proportional to the error. That is one part of the controller. The second part is, you can get the error, say ES, with another S in front, which means this is not the error, this is the error rate, rate of change of error, rate of change of error, whether the error is increasing or decreasing, but that speed of the error, rate of change of the error. You have to calculate that within the loop and then multiply with KD. And this is what is called the derivative gain. The derivative gain, rate of change related gain. And that's the second uh, part of the controller. The third part is error divided by S. So one over S means integration in time domain. So this is the error integral. You accumulate the error, you add the er add error right, on the timeline, and at any moment of time, there is an accumulated error. Sometimes error is positive, sometimes error is negative. So positive or negative cancel out, but eventually you will have net positive or net negative accumulation. And then you multiply that with the gain, we call it integral gain. So how much error has been accumulated so far? You look at that one. 
and multiply with ki right so these three terms are different to each other and they serve different purposes and they all have gains kp ki kd okay so if you have higher kp which means you give higher priority for proportional gain for the error if you have higher kd you give uh, prominence to the rate of change of error and if you give high value for i you give uh, a prominence for the accumulated error right so it's up to you to adjust these gains in order to achieve what you want so finally the control signal is the accumulation of all these three terms you are getting from the proportional part derivative part integral part uh, some control actions and you add them together and generate the final control signal which is over here and that is a signal that you uh, uh, connect to the plant so this error over here right in some books you will see the this arrow is actually split into three arrows one is proportional the other one is derivative and the other one is integral so you have the differentiation you have integration right and then three parallel paths proportional integral derivative add them together and you get the final control signal u p i d now there is another way of writing this uh, pid controller equation and uh, that is over here so what you do is you get kp out of this bracket right and write 1 over ti in, in in place of ki and uh, td in place of kd right you add two new parameters ti and td but you don't write k i and k d and if you compare these two equations you can see that this k p over t i is actually k i as i've seen here uh, written here and k p times t d is equal to k d okay so this way you can uh, calculate T i and uh, T d, right? Quite easily. So we'll stick to one of these uh, uh, definitions, either this way or that way. Okay, not both. Now, uh, Okay, uh, now let's look at these uh, terms a bit more because our discussion about PID is basically uh, not just mathematics, but uh, understand uh, uh, the details about this controller. Okay, uh, this is not a simple controller as it looks from the surface, right? It is a very sophisticated, very versatile controller. So let's take the proportional term first. Proportional term, right? This proportional term determines the responsiveness of the controller. The responsiveness of the controller, right? It determines whether the plant is control is aggressive or weak. Right? Aggressive or weak. Like for example, you, you have seen people who are very aggressive sometimes, right? For even a small error, they respond. And you have seen some people very weak, which means they don't react. 
to anything. Even though there are huge errors, they don't react or they react very uh, lightly. So this behavior uh, is there in the controllers also, whether the controller is very quick and aggressive or it is very, very slow to respond, right? So that comes from the proportional game. So this one, if you look at uh, that, this KP term, right? It is very, very important, KP term, to have a sizable value for KP. If you don't have sufficient KP, your controller is not responsive. And if you have too high of a KP, that is also a problem because it will try to respond to even small errors, which is unnecessary, okay? So we define error RT minus pi T. And by the way, uh, this uh, KP increases or decreases the bandwidth, system bandwidth. So when you say very aggressive controller, which means it has a higher bandwidth, okay? Higher KP means higher bandwidth. In the previous lecture, you saw that, right? When you put a gain in front of the plant, you increase the band, bandwidth. So KP is like that. It's just a constant in front of the plant. So it increases the bandwidth. Or you can use it to decrease the bandwidth also if it is less than one, okay? So increases or decreases system bandwidth. So when, uh, according to this definition of error, error is usually reference minus response. Positive command is generated when RT is greater than YT. So RT is, uh, uh, is higher than uh, YT. Then the error is positive. So you get a positive command. Of course, yes, right? When uh, YT is below RT, you need to have a positive command to bring YT up, right? And also it generates a negative command when RT is less than YT, which means YT is above RT, it's too much. Now you have to bring it down. To do that, you need to have a negative command. So therefore the command, sign of the command makes real sense, good sense, when you define your error like this. That is why error is defined this way, RT minus YT, not the other way, okay? Now the second question, if KP is very big, oh, which means you have a very wide bandwidth, all the frequencies, even very high frequencies travel from left to right and immediately you can see the response, right? So control is too sensitive and respond to even small errors. So, so mind you, all these signals, now let's say we have the reference signal to the plant, right? So most of the reference signals are actually accompanied by the noise. So therefore it is uh, not very appropriate to have very high bandwidth of the plant because the noise and the other parasitic signals that go in uh, the reference port, right, uh, will create unnecessary control action. So this happens when KP is very big. Then the controller tend to uh, respond to even small errors. That is not uh, uh, necessary actually, right? If KP is very small, on the other, ha other hand, control is not sensitive or very weak. And it waits till error grows big to produce a response. So this is another problem. So when you look at all both of these extremes, you can say uh, uh, safely that extremes are to be avoided. You should not go this way or that way. And you have to set your proportional gain uh, in the modest manner so that the controller respond, right, uh, uh, appropriately, okay? So now uh, let's look at uh, uh, look at one case here, right? So there you can see the plant GS, and then there's a disturbance coming from here, 
and this is a proportional control only p right there's no d there's no i it's just p and this is the error and error times kp is the control signal and there's a d here disturbance and together they control the plant so you might be wondering what this vertical arrow here d as i just explained we call it disturbance where do they come from they come from all over right uh, when we design control systems we sometimes tend to think that uh, it's it's only our signal that we generate using the controller right that will actuate the uh, the plant no it's not the case there are disturbances coming from around right that disturb the whole system right therefore when you design the control systems you need to have this additional property of the plant disturbance rejection disturbance rejection uh that is to say that uh, for whatever reason if there's a uh disturbance coming from the environment controller need to uh still maintain the required reference required level okay there can be a disturbance so there cannot be a disturbance sometimes there there are no disturbances in that case you maintain your level your response and then now there is a disturbance so you cannot maintain your uh, response you immediately understand you are not there then you act on it so that is what is called disturbance rejection in a moment i'll show you what a disturbance is right disturbances come from uh, the input side as well as output side uh the the internal disturbances are like gravity friction okay uh, when you deal with machines uh, you, you probably you don't have the friction model in the machine so therefore there is unnecessary uh, 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 energy loss within the system power loss within the system right how how to overcome that and the gravity uh, can cause problems let's say you provide a torque uh, to a load but um, uh, because of the gravity it cannot maintain the position the part of your torque is going to withstand or compensate the gravity and the other part of the torque goes to move it so eventually you will understand that not 100% of your torque is going for the motion part is wasted so these are internal disturbances external ones are like temperature pressure like if you are running an ac control system and everything is pretty normal uh, uh, and all of a sudden when you open a window right the hot air comes in you lose the cool air and there's a sudden disturbance so then the system will sense that through feedback and then uh, try to correct it so this is how systems are designed to be more resilient more robust okay now to appreciate uh, what are the additional features that you need to have in your controller to deal with di the disturbances so let me show this to you now if this is your uh, internal disturbance right uh, you can write this equation ut this is the signal that is coming over here sorry right ut is actually these two arrows added together so the control signal ut is uh this signal plus this signal so that is kp times error kp ess plus the disturbance d so we say at the equilibrium state when things are not uh, changing any more right this is to be zero okay again as i said the other day this zero doesn't mean mean absolute zero it is some relative zero right which is to say that you don't have to have additional control signal when the system is stable 
when you have your level reached after that you just maintain there this is that state so at that state right because of this d there is a steady state error ess which is equal to minus d over kb this is the problem the system is stable but there is an there is a steady state error that is the problem right so on one hand you are happy that system is stable if you look at this equation system is stable but immediately you will figure out figure out there's nothing to cheer because there is a error so the system has stabilized uh, at a level right different to the reference the reference is zero reference is zero let's say now this is uh, settling at some value given by d over kb if you have only a p controller that's what i'm saying now if i introduce uh, i controller the second one p i then d okay what is i controller i controller is this one you you accumulate this error over time right so it is a variable uh, uh, quantity and you multiply with ki right so in addition to kp you have ki also right then you have these two terms plus d this one is equal to zero if you reach the equilibrium if you reach the equilibrium then you can say what are the conditions that uh, you can derive from this condition this equilibrium um, of course uh, when this uh, equation is satisfied right uh, error cannot uh, uh, be non zero why if error is non zero this accumulation will change the value here then you will not have this equal to zero anymore so therefore only way you can achieve this uh, equation is that to say error is zero and whatever accumulated error up to this point now error is zero but up to this point the accumulated value is equal to minus d under this condition this equation this equality uh, is possible so which means you reach zero error you reach zero error and you stabilize the plant there so stabilizing a plant with zero error is what is needed it is the objective of a controller in the previous case you stabilize the plant but not but with an error so that is not the complete objective of a controller okay so the the difference between here and here is the integral control with this little example you can appreciate you can understand why you need an integral controller because the integral controller right if there is a error steady state error the integral controller will keep an eye on that error it will keep accumulating the error and this accumulated error because error is non zero will generate a control signal to move it from the present value present level to the next level so the error becomes zero so whenever there is an error because of the persistent disturbance here you definitely need to have an integral error path that is the i path of the uh, pid control is is that part clear to everyone
Is that part clear to everyone? So let me ask uh, from uh, Jabendra. Uh, Mustafa? Yes, sir. That's clear, right? Rumesh? Yes, sir. It's clear. Right. Yeah. Send the Yes, sir. Yes, it's clear. Right. Okay. So, uh, this is not very difficult thing to understand, but this is very important to understand as well. Okay. And when you so so when i say you understand this one you have to understand comprehensively okay not just uh, uh, logical uh, sentences remembering things like that right so it should be uh, uh, absolutely clear uh, to you right this integral term if it if it if it is there right will naturally accumulate if there is an error so it will it will cease its action. It will go to sleep only when the error is zero and persistent. Only when the error is zero and keep it persistent for some time, then only the integral part will rest, will go to sleep. The moment there's an error and it is persistent, right? Integral controller will accumulate it and generate a signal to correct that. Okay, so that is why it is extremely important. And also, these things are required when there is a friction in the plant, when there's gravity, uh, because these are uh, nonlinear uh, uh, disturbances, and we usually don't model them in our model. So, therefore, when you try to practice it, uh, you will see anomalies because of gravity, friction, etc. So therefore better to have this integral part to uh, compensate for that kind of errors, okay? Let's uh, look at an example, uh, how these disturbances come into the plant, okay? Uh, so this is a robot link and uh, we have a control system p alone you can see it over here is p and we want to control the position of the uh, robot arm right position is uh, in terms of angle this angle theta so um, we want to maintain this angle theta at different levels uh, 90 60 whatever right and we produce we, we take the theta and feed it back, this is the reference value, and the, this is the error, error goes to the P controller, will generate uh, the signal. So this is the torque signal that we provide to the motor. But in the same time, you can see, uh, even without uh, our control signal, which is coming from this error, right? The link is heavy. This link is heavy. There's a weight of this link. This weight produces a torque this way. And this torque goes as a disturbance. Understand? So if the motor cannot compensate for these disturbances, you can't maintain your position. So this is a classical example where gravity becomes a disturbance. The gravity becomes a disturbance. Okay. So when you model the plant, if you model with gravity, then that, that's okay. Wherever possible, you try to model all these things. I'm not saying that you don't do that. Wherever possible, model it. But if it is not possible to model, right you have you have to keep that in mind that this is not model but it will be it will behave as a disturbance and uh, you might not get the the beautiful result you expect okay right so 
if you write down an equation uh, for the loop, I can write it like this, uh, Kp times theta r minus theta ss. Let's say the system is stabilized somewhere, right? The system is stabilized somewhere, right? So we call it uh, theta ss, theta ss. This is the equilibrium point. When everybody is happy, there's a deal done. So things are stable, okay? Now we want to find out where this equilibrium is finally attaining, right? Uh, I mean, the position of the link, whether it is a reference or somewhere else, okay? So this is the control signal over here and minus, this is a negative top. So MGL cos theta SS is theta SS is equal to zero. When this torque, right, uh, minus this torque is zero, there is no torque. When there's no torque, there's no motion, system is stable. So now you follow this uh, set of equations, theta s, right? Uh, you can calculate theta s in this uh, nonlinear equation, theta double s plus 0.85 cos theta double s minus one equals zero. And when you numerically solve this one, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to solve this, but to get to the number, right? Once you numerically solve this one, theta s is 0 0.15 radius uh, and that, is not zero. So, if you if you ask, right? Let's say in this particular case, you can see theta r is one. Theta r is one. So your reference is one radians. Your reference is one radians, but actually steady state value theta ss is 0 0.15 radians. Can you see the difference? You cannot achieve one radian. So your command here is one, but the response here, final response is 0 0.15. It will never achieve one radians. So which means this P control is not good actually, right? You need to have a better controller so that you can achieve when you have one here, one here. The response has to be equal to the reference. But the system is stable. Now it has achieved a certain level and stabilized. System, there's nothing wrong with the system. It, it's something wrong with the controller, right? There's no provision to compensate for this additional disturbance store and then drive this one towards the reference. So the eye controller is brought in in this kind of situations to eliminate this steady state error. Without eye controller, this equilibrium will last forever, will last forever. So when uh, with the eye controller, it will look like Kp one plus one over Tis, right? That is the Pi kind of controller. So then if Yt is less than Rt, error is zero, uh, error is greater than zero, positive. And the integral part will accumulate an error which is greater than zero drives yt to rt so gradually this yt actually this response now it will be driven towards uh, the reference and it will stabilize the plant now at the reference value at the reference value having said that you need to be uh, like portioned about the uh, risk also with the integral controller because error accumulation with the big value of ki could generate large control commands 
that would cause the response to overshoot or under, undershoot, which is called the relative instability. This is also to be uh, remembered because if you have your reference, um, in fact, your response above your reference, right? You are having negative error for some time. You are having a negative error for some time and you accumulate it for some time. And because of the negative error, it produces a negative command, which will bring the curve down to the reference so that the error, right, even though it is negative, it will become smaller. By the time it becomes smaller, smaller and zero, there is already accumulated error. So this accumulated error will further drive the response below uh, the reference. Then at that point, the error becomes positive. But because of the negative accumulation being a bit bigger, the integral controller still generate the negative command, even though the error is positive now. Okay. So the error is positive, which means the curve is below the reference. But still, the command is negative. It will drive further down. And as it goes further down and down and down, it will generate the positive error to compensate the accumulated negative error. Understand? So this can cause problems, which means the curve is going uh, like below the reference, above the reference for too long. It is going to be like persistent rather than uh, uh, converging to the reference. It will keep going up and down unless you control your gain properly. If you control the integral gain properly, this integral part will be just one part of the control signal, not the biggest part of the control signal or the only part of the control signal. Right? You have to make sure that the proportional gain is there on the side. It is operating in parallel and it will have the upper hand right? when there is positive, positive command, when there is negative, negative command. And together with it, you have the integral controller, right, which will act on the accumulated error. But the, the integral command will not overtake the proportional part of the controller. If you do that, you are in trouble because this uh, swinging up and down, overshoot, undershoot thing will overtake the proportional action of the controller. Okay, so this is very important uh, uh, to be understood. Is that part clear? Is that part clear? Because you can't have only integral controller. In that case, you will be swinging back and forth, up and down without converging to the reference. But if you have the proportional controller playing the upper hand and integral controller only giving some support to that one, then you have a much better system where your control signal is uh, very appropriate. There's no unnecessary oscillations and you converge the reference uh, at a reasonable time. So is that part clear? Because this is the fundamental thing I want uh, everyone to know. Vikram Singh, is that clear to you? Yes, sir. Uh, Veera Singh? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. It's okay, sir. Right. Uh -huh. Petty Is that clear? And Nipuna? Yes, sir. All right. 
ओके okay uh capacity baller's mic is not working i right, find that's okay uh, so this is extremely important okay this is not just uh, superficial mathematics right uh, the understanding of why we need to have the integral controller uh, and uh, integral controller cannot sustain uh, by itself right there should be proportional gain that part of the controller taking the upper hand and the integral part is only supporting to get rid of these persistent errors, disturbances, etc. Right? Uh, this kind of knowledge is extremely important. Okay. What time is it? It's, uh, so let's take a little break now, about 10 minutes. Right? Right, uh, let's get started. Uh, there's a question in the chat box. Uh, how we are going to implement the PID controller, whatever the controller, the designing system, is it by designing? I see. Yeah, you will learn this uh, later in the course, right? Uh, you don't design uh, an IC, right? You can, uh, there are ways to do that. Uh, fundamentally, these PID controllers can be uh, uh, implemented using analog components, or if you want to uh, code it into a digital uh, platform like uh, Raspberry Pi, Peak, or Arduino, whatever, uh, then you can interface that to the plant and it will run. Uh, there are, there are uh, ways to do that if you want to do analog controller using basic uh, rlc components right uh, for practice and uh, for pleasure you can do that it will work but uh, for uh, modern uh, controllers uh, almost everything is digital right digital control so uh, everything that you do in here in analog domain can be converted to digital version. There are corresponding digital versions uh, straight away. So therefore, uh, there's no problem coding everything in digital hardware, right? And uh, attach this uh, those controllers to the plants. So that is how uh, it is happening uh, in the industry. So uh, the contents are there. To answer that question, you will know uh, better details uh, as we move forward, right? Okay. Uh, so then uh, we are on to the D controller. What is D? Um, on the surface, it is derivative. We know that. Okay. But if we dig uh, uh, a bit um, down, we will figure uh, more interesting uh, stuff. Like, for example, uh, uh, if you have any corrective action based on the rate of change of the error, right? So if you first look at the rate of change of error, that is E dot T, which is equal to R dot T minus Y dot T. Now, uh, for simplicity, let's say the reference is uh, uh, a constant, let's say a step signal, reference being step maybe zero or non-zero value, a constant step signal, then R dot T is going to be zero, right? So therefore the uh, uh, derivative part of the controller, that is U D T will be K D times the gain times Y dot T. So only this part will be non-zero Y dot T and it's negative, it's negative. Okay, 
so which means when uh, there is a positive rate of change in the plant in the response this guy will produce a negative command because of this negative this one over here this is exact opposite of what the response is trying to do when the response is trying to uh, climb this will not support that and vice versa so when this uh, uh, when when sorry when the con when the response tries to descend go down even that is not uh, uh, supported by the derivative controller because always it is the other way around because of this negative so for positive rate of change this will generate a negative command for negative response rate of change this will produce a positive command now what is he what is this controller uh, this controller does not look at the the actual level where whether we are above the reference or below the reference or right on the reference it doesn't care about that it will only care whether you are going to change from where you are now right whether you are trying to move up or whether you are trying to move down from your existing position so why dot means that right it doesn't have anything related to the present value of y whether y is above the reference below the reference or at the reference it doesn't care about that it only cares about rate of change whether you are going uh, to move up or move down and it will resist that motion it will resist that motion okay so if you look at uh, the, uh, this one here error being rt minus yk right uh, uh, so I, I use k here because i want to do bit of discrete control discrete control to to tell you this approximate uh, derivative calculation right um, then yk is uh, 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 the k is the time stamp here simple k is the time stamp here k from goes from 0 to 1 to 2 3 4 like that so then e dot k the rate of change of error right at time k is e k minus e k minus 1 over 2 so this is the previous error sorry this is the previous error this is the present error the k here is the time stamp okay discrete time so uh, uh, then if you substitute for e k from this equation that is r t minus y k minus if you calculate error k minus 1 from this equation k minus 1 then this becomes r t minus k minus y k minus 1 so like that so eventually it will be y k minus y k minus 1 negative in other words y k minus 1 minus y k okay y k minus 1 minus y k over t so that is e dot k rate of change of error now if you go to this diagram here where you can see the time right this is the uh, the response yt right this is the reference level suppose you are like this you are above the uh, reference and you are still increasing and here you are above the reference but you are going down towards the reference and in this case you are below the reference but you are climbing up towards the reference and in this case you are below the reference and you are going further down so these are four possible scenarios there can be other scenarios like this you are, you are maintaining the level you are climbing up down around the reference these are the possibilities so just let's look at these four situations right 
So in these two cases, because you are above the reference, you are above the reference here, right? This is bigger than this one. Error is negative. Error is negative. So when you are here in this area, your error is negative. Right? And when you are below the reference, your error is below the reference. So this is smaller than this one. The error is positive. It is positive in this case. So this is how we define the error. So when you are below the reference, error is positive. So the proportional controller will produce a positive command so that you will be pushed upwards. And when you are here above the reference, error is negative so that the proportional controller will produce a negative signal so that to bring you down towards the reference. And also if you look at the E dot rate of change, right, E dot, E dot is coming from here, that is yk minus one minus yk. So previous minus present. Right? So in this particular case, when you are rising, it's a negative rate of change. When you are going down, it's a positive rate of change. This is positive rate of change. This is negative rate of change. This is positive rate of change. So it, it's uh, important that you look at your response curve uh, against the reference, right? And figure out these signs, error and error rate, right? When they are positive and when they're negative. And then figure out how the PID controller create proportional part of the controller and the derivative part of the controller. And when you combine these two together, it, it, does it make any sense to you, right? This control signal. So for example, let's say you are climbing up and you are above the reference and still climb, climbing up, right? So because error is positive, you get positive proportional command and uh, error rate is negative. You are, you are, you are getting, now error rate is negative, right? This one is negative. So you get a negative command from the uh, derivative part. Understand? So this error rate is, is negative when you are here. Error rate is negative. So you get a negative command from the derivative part and positive command, uh, negative command from the proportional part also. So they, they together will produce a big negative part. And, and I think it is exactly what we want also because now you are already up above the reference and you are still going up. Okay. So therefore proportional controller, derivative controller, they both try to bring it down quickly. So you have to do this very quickly. So it makes perfect sense. Now, when it comes over here, right? You are below the reference and going further down. It's, it's very bad situation, okay? Now, if you look at the error, error is positive, you get a positive command from the proportional part and error rate is also positive. So you get a positive command from the derivative controller also. So together, you get a big positive command. That is exactly what you want because you are below the reference and further going down, you want to have the proportional uh, derivative and if possible integral part also, all of these components work together to make a big positive uh, uh, command to change this course and come back towards the reference. So this and this, in these two cases, the PD part makes perfect sense. Integral part, we cannot say for sure because it is it depends on the accumulated error. It comes from the past, right? But if you look at uh, only the most recent part here, 
this error is positive, right? Error is positive. So it is accumulating now. Positive command is accumulating. So therefore, it is also helping you out. It also generates a positive command unless it doesn't have a huge negative accumulated error in the past. But that we don't know. If there's a huge uh, negative part coming from the past, distant past, even though now it is positive error, right? you might have negative accumulated error, net negative accumulated error even now. And that will drive uh, the controller. That is a, a bad signal, not correct, not appropriate. So that is why integral controller should be very carefully used and you, you should reset it time to time, okay? And anyway, better not to give higher prominence to that controller, make it like small gain compared to the proportional gain. Sometimes you can see the, the same thing, integral controller in our society, right? Uh, we are taking a lot of things in the past that happened in the past, 30, 40, 50, 100 years ago, and still we are taking decisions based on those experiences. Doesn't match, doesn't tally with the present context. But the present context should be handled with the present uh, situations, present scenarios, present information, with some uh, weighted average coming from the past. You need to look at the past. You need to learn from the lessons from the past, right? But you should not let your past to drive you entirely. That is not good. So best example is PID. You, you need to use the accumulated error, right? But you should not bring the entire history to the present and try to make decisions for the present and future. So that is not correct. So here is a classical example, PID. Right. And if you look at the other two cases, these two. In this particular case, the response is actually above the reference, right? And therefore, uh, there is a negative error. So the proportional part has a negative effect. It will try to bring it down. That is good. And if you look at the uh, error rate, error rate is positive in this case. Error rate is positive. So therefore, it will generate a positive command. It will generate a positive command because it doesn't like going down. Now, in this situation, you have the proportional part generating a negative command, the derivative part generating a positive command. Now, can somebody tell me which one of these two should be uh, stronger? Proportional part or derivative part? So when you are above the reference, you have to bring down, right? You have to come down so that you need to generate a negative command. So negative, command. this part should be higher, okay? And derivative part is positive in this case. It should be smaller. So you are comparing this one and this one. In this particular case, you need to have a very strong negative command. Whereas in this case, you need to have a negative command, but you don't have to be that strong. Why? You are anyway going down to the reference. Even if you don't do anything, it will continue and you will reach the reference sooner. So therefore, you better generate a negative command, but not so be. So therefore, this you achieve proportional and derivative together because this is positive, negative, this is positive. So therefore you have a net negative value, which is not as big as when it was here. So it makes a perfect sense. So I don't want to uh, explain this one, uh, same logic you can uh, 
figure that out. Any questions, please, about the derivative controller? Uh, Herath, do you understand the derivative and proportional combination here? Yes, sir. Okay. Vikram Singh. Yes, sir. Okay. Kalana? Yes, sir. Right. Jairatna? Jairatna? Understood, sir. Uh, do you understand this uh, combination, proportional and derivative? Yes, sir. Right. Okay. Fine. Now let me show you a actual result of a, a servo tuning right uh, uh, task. Now. As you know, uh, let's say you want uh, to design a robot, right? Uh, and you, uh, according to your design, this robot has, uh, let's say, five joints. So you need to have five motors, right? Uh, the modern day is that you purchase what is called a multi-axis motion control system, where you have this uh, central controller which is something like uh, the uh, uh, network switch right you connect all of these five motors to that switch and then you connect it to the computer so through the computer you can control all five motors right uh, these are kind of turnkey solutions so you can easily design and build uh, mechatronic robotic systems using motion control systems multi-axis so uh, in one of these uh, multi-axis motion control systems, if you open your laptop and connect the controller uh, to that one using USB, right? Uh, uh, you can open up these uh, interfaces and tune these motors, tune these motors. This is the first thing you do. Uh, uh, you can have motors loaded or unloaded, doesn't matter, right? Either way, uh, uh, you can, uh, you can test a different uh, PID values and see what is the response you are getting. Okay, immediately you can see it on screen, right? Uh, in this uh, mechatronic system or robot, uh, I can check motor by motor. I know how, uh, how much load is going to be handled by this particular motor. So I can load that motor with that kind of torque, right? Load. And then I, I, I go to the interface and I set these values, KD, let's say uh, 300, KP, 20, uh, KI, uh, zero, no, no, no I, right? This is just to give you uh, some idea of what happens if you don't have KI, integral part, okay? So tuning method is manual. There are other automated tuning methods also if you want to, uh, use uh, then you don't have to do anything at all and axis is basically x here axis means the motor number x y z it goes like that so you you figure out the motor number right uh, so this is a perform tuning test uh, then you can start the test so when you click this switch start test you will see the motor is running that particular motor connected to axis X, it is running, it is controlled by this PID controller, right? 
uh, back and forth, back and forth, which means from zero, it goes to about uh, uh, nearly 40, not 40, and then stay there for a while and come down to zero, not zero, it go past zero, and then stay there for another 500, uh, um, let's say these are milliseconds. Uh, sampling period is two milliseconds, right? So this is 500 times two milliseconds. This is about one second, okay? So it goes up and down like that. So you can physically see the motor is turning uh, to its right, a certain angle and stop there for about a half a second and then come back and stay around zero, another probably half a second and goes back. It's like that. So the command given here to move is actually about uh, 40 counts here. It's 40, uh, this is not the degrees. No, uh, it is radians. Uh, it is pulse count, pulse count. As you know, uh, when you deal with motors, um, uh, how do you define or describe the angle? We don't use angle degrees or radians there, right? That is all in, in the books, the theories. When it comes to the practice, when you really code it, you use pulse counter, right? Uh, maybe you can have 8-bit, 10-bit, 12-bit uh, counter, which gives you uh, uh, a count, pulse count. And there's mathematics to convert that into angle, radians or degrees. That's, that's a separate thing. So this is 40 counts. It goes 40 counts, stop there and come back to zero. So there you can see that even though you ask it to go to 40, it doesn't really go to 40. It will stop prematurely. And also, when you, when you ask it to go to 40 the other way, it goes past 40, past zero, and stops somewhere. So maybe this is a disturbance working in one direction, working in one direction, right? So, and there's no way to uh, uh, correct this error because there's no I, there's no I. So now using the same uh, interface, you can do this. Uh, uh, KD, you, uh, you lower it to 50, right? So it's a lower uh, D value. Now what happens? You get oscillations here and here. Big oscillations, right? Why? Because D is smaller now. D is only 50. Earlier it was like 300 or so, right? Don't worry about these numbers, right? These are just gains, and no units. Uh, now, because uh, the derivative part is weakened, not as strong as earlier, uh, these oscillations going up and down cannot be properly controlled because it is the derivative controller who opposes any motion up or down. Now this upward motion, right, was not there earlier. It was very small because it was KD 300. KD doesn't like motions, doesn't like oscillations. So when you have strong KD, which means no oscillations. Here, on the other hand, it's a weaker KD. So oscillations can present like that, okay? Just to give you an idea of what happens when you play around with these gains up and down, what, what you are supposed to uh, see on screen, okay? And this is another one. Uh, when KD is extremely high, extremely high, uh, there you can see the derivative controller while it is trying to respond to the genuine change of the response curve, it also is responding to the noise in the response signal. So the response signal, what you get is genuine response plus noise around it, right? A small noise. So when you do the differentiation, this noise also gets differentiated. 
so rate of change of noise is uh, is as big as or maybe better higher uh, as the genuine signals uh, rate of change and when you have a big kd this noise differentiation will be visible because it is amplified too much by the KD. So you will see this, this data kind of thing, thing around the reference, uh, sorry, the response. Because the noise differentiation uh, is kind of random. It can be positive now and the next moment it can be negative. And the next moment can be positive again because it's noise. So that is why you have this varying uh, 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 um, a noise kind of signal around the uh, response. So therefore, uh, the takeaway is that you have to control KD, the different uh, derivative gain, right, a slightly lower than uh, uh, the proportional gain, right. But of course, you need to look at what you get, what you see on the screen, and based on that, you have to make changes. Now, <clears throat> uh, let's look at tuning PID controllers. So this is actually to find out, strike the best match between KP, KD, KI for a plant. As we know already now, uh, KP makes the system responsive to errors. However, a bigger value of KP will make the system overly sensitive. That is not good. Then it starts to respond even to noise. Noise. Okay. Now, if you look at KI, integral part reduces the steady state error. That is important. That is why we bring it, especially when you have friction, backlash, gravity kind of thing, right? Uh, that you stop prematurely before you get to the reference. Okay. So to get rid of that kind of persistent errors in the steady state, you need to have KI. But if you use it uh, inappropriately, or if you give it a higher weightage, uh, it will lead to oscillations, overshoot and undershoot, that will reduce the stability, relative stability of the plant. Then finally, KD, uh, KD is used to stabilize the system because it doesn't allow oscillations. If you see oscillations in your response, you better increase the KD gain a little bit, okay? But it will slow down uh, the plant slow down the plant because it doesn't allow you to change. Sometimes in order to reach the reference, you have to change from where you are. If you are above the reference, you have to go down. If you are below the reference, you have to climb up. But the derivative controller doesn't allow you to do that. So therefore, you need to keep derivative controller under control, right? Uh, it will only be able to modulate the action, not to actually have an upper hand of the entire PID controller. So eventually when I summarize all these things, the upper hand is always for the P, KP. And then comes KD and then comes KI. When you use KI, you need to sometimes reset KI. Time to time, you flush your accumulated error because this is how you get rid of the past, right? Whatever happens in the past, it's, it's not very good to bring it too long, okay? Then, uh, the most favorable response can be achieved by proper adjustment of the three individual controllers, right? Now, if you want to tune a PID controller, right, there are methods, standard methods, right, like Siegler Nichols, Cohen code and ITAE, that is integral of time weighted absolute error based methods. So, 
So these uh, methods are available. There are a lot of documents on the internet also. You can refer these documents and tune your BID controller. Uh, these techniques are not highly analytical. They are cut and try, tool, rule of thumb, empirical methods, right? Therefore, these methods will bring you somewhat closer to the ideal PID uh, values. Uh, whole purpose is for you to get closer to the ideal. And after that, you, for every system, you have to do fine tuning yourself to get to the, uh, uh, the perfect possible uh, response. Okay, right. So uh, let's look at uh, Siegler Nichols method. This is a very old method for PID tuning, probably as old as uh, PID itself. Uh, in order to tune a PID controller using Siegler met Nichols method, you need uh, you need to have these two graphs that is basically body plot of your plant so you, let's say you have the plant right open loop so you need to generate these body plots you have the gain here you have the face here so gain goes like this uh, we don't know generally maybe it goes like this and this is how the face goes And at some uh, point for some frequency, uh, you can see 180 degree uh, phase shift. For some plants, you don't have this one. In that case, you can't apply this particular signal necklace method, right? But there's so many other methods available. Uh, now, suppose your plant satisfy this condition that it has a crossover frequency, which means at that particular frequency, the phase delay is 180 degrees, right? And when you come up to the magnitude, you can see it is below uh, 0 dB or 1. This is absolute gain. You have this as gain margin, gain margin. So you have a net gain margin and you have a crossover frequency. If your plant is like that, you can design your PID controller using this method. This is the result. I can't say result, this is the template actually. It's very simple. So you, you have your response and figure out your gain margin. And also you can calculate your crossover frequency with these two information, you can use this table and calculate your KP, KI, KD. KP, KI, KD. How? Now, let's say you want to have just a proportional controller. Right? Just a proportional control. No I, no D. Then what is the value of KP? 0.5 GM. So get the GM, gain margin, not DB. The absolute okay and get half of that and that is okay put it there and try the plant you will get a good response and after that you can tune it further say five percent at a at a time increase it whether check whether you get a better response if so add another five percent like that you can quickly get to the the best KP value. Now, I don't know why you want to have only P controller, but this is not recommended. Let's say you have a PI controller, right? P and I together. So then what you do is you reduce your gain from 0.5 to 0.45 times the gain margin. And this is your new KP. And your I, Ki is 1.2 times Kp over 
TCO. So this TCO is actually coming from the frequency, this FCO. You know, one over FCO is actually TCO. T is the period of this frequency. Okay. So one over F is basically uh, uh, in Hertz, right? Uh, T, TCO. If you if you want to design a PID, the full PID controller, you need to calculate KT, KI, KD, all of them. So in that case, you follow this one. You get 0.6 times GM gain margin, and you increase KI two times KP over TCO, and this is KD 0.125 KP TCO. This is how you design your gains. And then you try it out, you get some response, right? And thereon, you can manually tune KP, KI, KD, taking say 5% increase at a time. And uh, in a matter of few hours, you can find the best combination. Now, if you look at this table here, uh, particularly this area, you can see that your proportional gain here, when you have only P part, okay, reduces slightly when you bring in integral controller, PI. The moment you have this I here, right, you, you reduce your KP from 0.5 to 0.45, that is 5%. Can somebody tell me why? What's the reason for that? Any answer? If you have followed the logical arguments we were discussing, this should be pretty obvious. Can somebody tell me, the moment you bring in integral controller here, why do you have to reduce the proportional gain? Go ahead. No answer? Why don't you just uh, use your intuition, logical thinking, and try to figure out an answer? You can be wrong. Is it a problem? If you have some logic behind your answer, go ahead and present it. If it is wrong, fine. You, you understand. That's it. But you learn a lot that way. Controllers working, both, both part working together. Okay. And uh, integral controller, the all integral cannot be uh, practically designed. Some proportional components will be there. I didn't uh, figure out exactly your point. Can you clearly explain? Uh... When you do practically for in the KI, some KP component will be there to overcome that. From the original KP, it is reduced. Mm. Not quite the answer I expected. Okay, so any other answers, please? Both proportional and together. So the moment you bring in integral controller, why do you have to reduce KP? That is my point. Early answer is that KI has part of KP. So therefore you don't have to have the full 0.5 GM now because part of that is still there in KI. So that is why you reduce. 
that is the existing answer is there any answer any other answer for that the error accumulation go ahead give me the complete answer others please Um, because the uh, integral control tends to uh, increase the overshoot in order to compensate for that uh, we have to decrease the proportional gain exactly that is the answer i was expecting the integral controller here right while it is helping us to reduce the steady state error there's a tendency that it will encourage overshoot and undershoot it will uh, elevate the response right beyond the reference and below the reference right due to the accumulated error it will encourage overshoot and undershoot in order to control that to some extent you reduce your kp from 0.5 to 0.45 so therefore even though this accumulation is happening it is giving rise to the overshoot and undershoot the signal value that that you are getting is somewhat smaller understand so it is not precisely calculated thing just reduction of the gain kp gain by 5% just that so it is basically intuitive but it is very logical very rational what we do here okay now the next question remember i am asking all these question in the paper also right in some way or the other so therefore i don't really look at your numbers final numbers when you answer uh, but your logical approach will be checked so therefore it is very important that you engage in these uh, questions and come up with your answers when you answer questions whether they are right or wrong doesn't matter it will help me to get you a better response okay so that that is good for all so uh, while i appreciate the correct answers i also appreciate the wrong answers right in the in the discussion because it it helps so next question following up with the first one now then let me know when you why the uh, proportional gain further increases right that like rebounding to 0.6 when you bring kd in and also why ki also increases from 1.2 to 2 the moment you bring in the derivative control KD introduce damping and slow down the control. Yes, exactly. Now remember, now previous uh, question and the answers and the discussion, right? Uh, uh, help to get this uh, correct answer first time around. So this is what I'm saying. It is extremely important to get engaged, uh, provide you answers, so that. it is much more learning than just uh, listening to me in the in the lecture right so in this interactive questions one or two uh, produces a lot of result so the second question the answer is spot on whereas the first question it went here and there and eventually somehow we managed to get all onto the correct answer but the second one based on the first one spot on so why kd provides damping which means it doesn't allow big changes it it resists the motion resists the motion so therefore if you want to move you need to increase your gains both kp and ki the moment you have kd you have other two gains high okay so this is something that we see not only in pid but uh, in other uh, uh, many other 
places as well. Uh, like for example, uh, if you if you drive a car, if you drive a car, right, and uh, you want to brake and stop, so what you do is uh, you uh, uh, you take your foot from the gas pedal and put it on the brakes, right? So this is overly simplified uh, uh, situation. So when you take your foot from the gas pedal. There is no acceleration further, right? And then you put your foot on the brakes, you will stop. That is one way of stopping the car. But there are other ways also. Like what if you use your both feet, one on the gas, one on the brake. So you are now giving some gas while you are giving the brakes applied, both ways. You can still... Uh, slow down and stop the vehicle. You don't have to do that, right? But if you do it that way, right, it's another way of not only uh, stopping the vehicle, but stopping is in a steady manner, steady manner, right? So this is being practiced in aircrafts, right? Whenever they land, they don't shut down the engine and <laughs> land, right? Engine is running, it's not actually idling, right? Uh, you should not bring the acceleration to zero, but you have some sort of braking, but while you are pushing forward, still pushing forward. So there are requirements like that because final requirement in, in like in that vehicle case, the objective is stop the vehicle. But in complicated systems, uh, there are other concerns also around that final objective so that you need to maintain safety, steadiness in your motions and things like that. So therefore, when you, when you stop, until you come to stand still, you don't uh, put your foot from the gas pedal. You keep it there and apply some sort of acceleration, but your brakes will be more than that so that it will stop. When everything is settled down only, you take your foot out, right? So like that. So here, now when you bring KD in, right, you essentially don't need to bring, keep these things high. But if you do that, you get slightly better performance. That is why you do it that way. Right. Now, Kohenkun, the second PID, uh, tuning method. Uh, if you want to use Cohen Kuhn method and uh, tune your PID, uh, you need to first uh, get your uh, step response. And it has to be something like this. Like there's a delay initially, there's a delay initially, and then you pick up and then you settle over here. Some something like a first order response, okay, or approximate first order response, which can be modeled like this k times e to the minus tau d s over tau s plus one. So tau d is actually the delay, initial delay here, and t is the rise time, right? Uh, so, uh this is basically the time constant here, right? Price time is actually 90% of that. Okay, fine. So we'll uh, measure these values from the response. The DC gain here, K, the delay, and the time constant. With a simple open loop test, you can uh, get this graph, and you can calculate these parameters, right? Delay, time constant, and the gain. The moment you calculate these things, you just need to refer to the table here. KP, TI, TD. Okay. So you know how to convert TI to KI, TD to KD, right? That you can do using these equations. Yeah. Like this TI, TD. This how these parameters are related to each other.
So now if you want to design only a proportional controller, this is the value of the KP. It is the uh, uh, time constant, right? Over DC gain times delay within bracket one plus time delay over three times time constant. So this is coming from various uh, not very analytical derivations, right? Uh, different ap approximations. And sometimes it's difficult to find out theories for this, right? How, how the orig original uh, uh, pioneers of this uh, Kohen Kuhn actually derived these things. It's hard to find. Uh, and uh, there's uh, also uh, not a serious need there to derive any of these things. Our purpose here in this course is to look at the available references and get going. To use these tables and uh, tune a controller and see how good or bad the controller is. So, if you want to design a PI controller, PI controller, so this is how you do, right? This is the KP, this is TI. Again, you can see we use the three parameters, DC gain, delay, and the time constant. If you want to design a PD controller, there's no I here, P and D, it's like this. And if you want to design a PID, fully fledged PID controller, P, I and D are like that. Uh, finally, the integral of time weighted absolute error methods. This is a bit more analytical, right? Uh, but it goes through many simulations and things like that. And that is how people got these numbers and all, right? Again, we are, uh, it's a very big discussion, long discussion, and uh, we don't have complete reference also of some of these things. So that's all. We get this final template and we know roughly what the background is. Uh, there, the controller uh, tries to optimize this one, which is time times ET, that is absolute error, time weighted, and then integrate it and try to minimize this, try to minimize this. So which means when you go farther and farther, uh, you give a little uh, 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 weightage to the error. The recent errors are given uh, higher priority. So this is one way of uh, getting rid of the past, uh, not completely forgetting the past. So in a smooth manner, we get rid of the past, right? We bring forward the recent ones, of course, right? Uh, and that makes a lot of sense. So finally, uh, just like the previous case, Kahun uh, Kuhn, uh, you have the uh, step response for the online plant and you figure out your time delay, time constant and the gain, right? Uh, so from the response, you can you, you use your gain, this capital K here, this one, DC gain, and tau D, uh, the delay, and tau uh, is the time constant, right? Uh, so you put those three parameters, right, into this equation where you calculate one big parameter called uh, gamma. So the big, big, big gamma here, right? You calculate using this equation that you have sigma one tau d over tau times to the power sigma two. So these two parameters are known from the response. It's coming from the response, right? This one. And sigma one and sigma two are coming from the table. Sigma one, sigma two. Okay. And this is the control. You may have a P controller. Say you want to have a P controller. You go to the table, 
and read sigma 1 and sigma 2 that is 0 0.949 uh, and minus 1.084 you read these two parameters from the table and substitute it over here sigma 1 and sigma 2 these two parameters are known so you cal calculate gamma okay and you bring it here the gamma and the dc gain here will let you know will tell you kp and gamma and the time constant will tell you ti and td as well so that is how you calculate these parameters okay but if you get the first row here which is only for proportional controller you calculate kp only you don't go below that only kp you stop there that's it and let's say you are designing a pi controller pi controller right you first read sigma 1 and sigma 2 for gamma d gamma d sorry this is gamma p this has to be gamma p okay proportional part that is 0.859 and minus 0 0.977 you take these two parameters and put it over here for sigma 1 and sigma 2 and calculate gamma p and you put that gamma p over here divide by the dc gain and that's your kp so you calculate your kp like that and that's it you stop there and then come back to the table and read uh, these two parameters for sigma 1 sigma 2 0.674 minus 0 0.680 these two and put it to the same equation with tau d and tau and calculate this time gamma i gamma i and put that gamma i over here over here and calculate your ti okay and if you want to do a pid controller you do the same process for uh, uh, taking these two parameters and calculate your uh, KP, these two parameters calculate your TI and using these two parameters and put it over here, calculate your gamma D and put it over here uh, and calculate TD. So you have to handle this table bit, with a bit uh, more care right, than the previous cases, right? Because it can confuse you, but it is very nicely arranged structure here very concise bit complicated but it's really uh, uh, elegant presentation so with that you can calculate uh, either uh, 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 calculate the gains for a, either p controller p alone if you want or pi or pid and then you can simulate it and figure out whether you have the right controller if so that's done uh, but usually you get not the best controller but somewhat closer to that then the rest is uh, you need to uh, manually fine-tune and perfect the system so that's how PID works any questions please I think that part is uh, clear, right? Uh, I, I do not actually expect a lot of questions there because it's pretty straightforward, unless we have these uh, procedural problems with the tables. All right. So uh, I think that's it for the day. Uh, we have come to the end of the lecture also. Uh, so uh, from the course management point of view, uh, I will upload uh, the two videos today and the last week to the website early uh, next week maybe Monday and also I will make these uh, PowerPoint slides PDF form available because some of you uh, requested that uh, so far I uh, didn't do that because you have the book chapter anyway all the book chapters are available on the website 
So therefore, I did not uh, uh, publish this material also. Uh, but I can do that. And also, I will be sending out a couple of questions for you to uh, 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 answer. Uh, the design problems, right? Not the exam questions kind of things. Uh, because we don't know this time whether we are going uh, full uh, continuous assessment or whether you want to have an uh, exam at the end. Uh, still undecided, I think. Uh, Dr. Chamila will let you know how we are going to assess you. Right. Uh, professor? Yes. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Chamila uh, told us something about condition for having only the assignments for evaluating for the first semester. Oh, yes. For this yes, one. I heard. Yes. But things are changing. Uh, things are changing because these are options, actually. So uh, these are options available for us to uh, make decision. Uh, university is not going to dictate, uh, do it this way and that way. So let's see. Let's see whether we want to have a final exam or not, uh, or entirely go through this uh, assignment based We'll decide that. Uh, so far, I I also heard that one, but this might might change in the next couple of weeks. Uh, if not, we'll stick to that one, right? Okay. Any further questions? Right. Okay then. So that's it. Uh, that's it for the day. I'll see you next week. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you.